Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in. I am Caroline Tompkins, President and CEO of FIT, the Forum for International Trade Training. I am so thrilled to be interviewing Peter Hall today on his economic outlook for 2024 and sharing this with you, our audience, the FIT community. Peter is no stranger to most of you. In his role as CEO of Econosphere, Peter is a special advisor to FIT and other organizations, including government and private sector companies. He is an economist, a sought after thought leader, and he is also passionate about seeing companies succeed in international markets. He is by all accounts, an influential voice in the business community. And today we want to provide you a bit more of an in-depth economic outlook for 2024 through Peter's eyes. So welcome, Peter. Why don't we dive right into it with my first question. We'll start at a high level on the theme of chaos or crisis. You know that feeling uh, that we get when we turn on the news, we hear about the economy and everything is gloom. Since January, the forecasts I've been hearing uh, are decidedly gloomy. Not a great way to start the year, and for me, certainly not a great way to start my mornings, for that matter. But Peter, are the forecasts, are they, um, the forecasts, the media, are they on point? Is it doom and gloom? What's your take on it? Well, you know, um, the theme of chaos has been with us for a while. And, and thank you, Caroline, first off, for having me uh, here to do this. It's wonderful to be in front of the FIT community. I certainly hope that uh, those briefing notes are are helpful to uh, to the FIT community. I certainly enjoy writing them and communicating with you. And of course, the the whole objective is, as you say, we want Canadian exporters to succeed wildly out there uh, in the world. Well, how can you succeed in a world where uh, there is so much chaos that's going on? I mean, what uh, trade does is put you in the riskier spectrum of business. And so if the world has gotten riskier, then the riskier business has gotten that much more risky. And of course, uh, that sort of leads us to want to sort of back off uh, away from things. And so we have a huge appetite sort of as humans for gloomy news. Uh, it sells, uh, it spreads. And the, and the worst thing about this is that, you know, it can actually be self-fulfilling. We all get convinced about the fact that there is gloom and doom out there. And so we all rein in a little bit you know we 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 pull in those horns and we're not going to be going out there into the world and taking the kinds of risks we might otherwise do and of course when you know folk like us come along and say hey you know you got to be bearing some of these risks because that's where all the opportunity is well you tune us out real fast uh in a world uh where we're sort of dealing with the things that we're dealing with right now there's a long list of uh, of gloomy things and of course the forecasts that began this year were decidedly gloomy. And so is that really where we're going uh, as we go forward? Well, if all the experts are saying that, it's pretty hard for somebody to stand up and stick their hand up uh, like me and say, I'm actually not sure that we've got the message right. So it is a bit awkward, but uh, our message is, hey, let's let's cut through some of this gloom and see if there are good news stories that are out there, because if there are, they are certainly not being covered by the mainstream news. So it doesn't have to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And well, I know let's hope you... it isn't, you know, yes. that's the thing, because <laughs> yeah. if we get talked into gloom, whether the gloom exists or not, we could actually act as, as if the gloom was there and then create this lousy outlook just because nobody wants to do anything. Well, I know you, Peter you are always able to find that diamond in the rough. So I'm counting on you today to do it again for us. Is there a diamond in the rough? Is there any good news you can share with us with respect to the forecasts that we're hearing? Well, look, I, I think that there is good news out there. And my worry is that I think it's being buried. It's being smothered by the bad news. And look, the bad news has really been around since the global financial crisis. That was 2008. That was a long time ago, right? I mean, that's 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 what sixteen years ago now that um, that a really bad thing happened and left us sort of traumatized in its wake. And so the bad news has really been churning for an awful long time. And of course, COVID comes along and convinces us that the world is just not sustainable anymore. And um, whether that's true or not, you know, it traumatizes us even further. 
And if you're a young person and sort of trying to spread your wings in a market like this, you got my sympathy because you haven't really had an easy ride over this past long period of time where institutions really don't seem to have come through for us. Ideas don't seem to have landed and growth certainly hasn't been there to pick us all up. So if we're convinced that there's gloom and doom out there, there's a long legacy of it uh, for us to, to actually deal with and, and disentangle. Well, that makes my job even more difficult because everybody out there is convinced that, you know, the people that are, are seeing the sunny side of things must be trying to sell snake oil or, you know, fake watches or something like that. Um, it, it really is sort of a tough uphill climb. But when we cut to the actual facts, it's amazing how people's perspectives turn around. Okay. So you have my attention. You're tweaking my attention. <laughs> For sure there is good news, right? But it's buried and it can be hard to find. Um, so we were going to hear about that good news. But I also want to know, is, is it good enough news to act as an antidote to the chaos we're hearing about? Well, you know, anytime it comes to a question like this, and certainly when it comes to standing against the mainstream, I go straight to the numbers. I always do. What are the numbers actually telling me uh, that's out there? So the numbers on confidence are not inspiring at the moment. We go out there, we survey people, we survey consumers in every economy in the developed world, at least, and even some emerging markets. How are you feeling about things? Are you ready to go out there and make a big purchase and so forth? And none of those indices are doing anything at the moment. So that's that's a number that is actually a tangible thing. But let's remember that sentiment. What about the numbers on what's actually happening? And this is where it gets really interesting because confidence may be low, but momentum is not low. Uh, and that speaks greatly to the forecast momentum you know what has just recently happened is the forecaster's greatest friend because whether the news is good bad or neutral those numbers are actually telling us already what is going to happen regardless of whether there is a single number in the year that you're actually talking about how did you leave off last year what kind of level were you actually at and when we look at that um there is a lot that is incredibly inspiring out there and it's simply numbers it's just the numbers that are telling us uh, uh what is uh what you know what what is going on now momentum is not high in canada so we could look at our own momentum numbers and say hey you know what are you talking about i'm actually talking about the economies that drive the world economy what are their fundamentals what is their momentum what is actually uh, what, what are they actually saying uh, about uh, what, what it is that's going on? So we've done better in Canada and the U.S. than expected. Um, you know, Canada has been bumping along at about half the U.S. growth rate, which is unusual. Um, but we've been getting, you know, pulled along by a very positive U.S. story. And so Europe, you know, it bumbled along, it was weak, but its fundamentals were strong. So this helped everybody to post decent 2023 numbers. And, you know, in spite of all of that momentum and everything that's going on, the forecasts are still saying, eh, you know, or at least at the beginning of the year, they were saying, um, not, uh, not so sure, not so sure that we're actually going to have a good year this year. So I still haven't answered the question, Caroline. <laughs> I'm sort of, I'm sort of dangling it in front of everybody right now, but it's important to know all of the facets that are going into this. So really, when we look at the numbers, there's a very positive story there. Okay. Well, we'll delve into that in a little bit. I think, uh, I think what is on top of many people's mind is, uh, one of the key worries, uh, that came out at Davos this year was the cost of living, right? And inflation yep. eating away a huge chunk of incomes uh, and households all over the world really having to cut back. And despite the recent drop, will inflation continue to be a big problem for us for the balance of this year anyway? Well, that's, that's a tricky question to answer actually, because the price gains that we've seen in the past, they're pretty much permanent. So all of those increases that happened there are some volatile things out there, food and energy go up and down. And so there might be some retreat in both of those prices as we go forward. But for the balance of goods that are in that basket that the average person consumes every month, 
the the gains in price that we saw before. So in Canada, you know, year over year shot up to eight percent. Um, in the United States, it was double digit. Um, those gains that actually happened, they're embedded in the numbers now. Why is that? Well, in order to get back to prices that we had before, central banks would have to create deflation. General prices would have to come down. Now, that's a very tricky space to get into because when general prices start coming down, what do we do? Well, um, when prices are going up, we tend to pre-buy things because we don't want to pay tomorrow's high prices. When prices are going down, on the other hand, we we hold back everything because we say, well, look, if everything's going to be 5% cheaper tomorrow, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to defer my purchases. And of course, if the day after that, they're going to be even cheaper and so forth, well, you can defer your purchases indefinitely. So that's the kind of thing that will drive an economy into an almost irrecoverable depressionary cycle, you know, 1930 style, and nobody wants to go there. So the levels that we have prices at are pretty much entrenched. What central banks are trying to do is to create an economy where off those new levels, prices are growing at a 2% rate. Now, that might be a little bit too much uh, on the technical side for everybody, but I did want to say, look, you know, we do have to rebalance our budgets and hope that our wages catch up with what actually happened to us before, because otherwise, you know, our purchasing power is going to be down. Bottom line, though, is that central banks are winning this one. Um, in fact, the worry is that they're actually going to overdo it. And, you know, if anybody's got questions about that, that's a that's a very interesting one uh, to get into because the screws are pretty tight on the economy at the moment. And if you look at monthly movements in uh, in prices right now, averaged over a four month period of time so that there's not, you know, spurious one month wonder kind of things going on here, prices are actually dropping at the moment. And that's a danger zone, because if that continues, then that will ultimately get into the headline numbers and we'll see a headline number that's a negative there. And then our minds are going to start to play tricks on us and we could go into that deflationary cycle. Central banks will do everything to avoid that. So that's why I believe that in the second half of this year, we're going to get some relief on the interest rate side of things. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Let's just focus on the inflation story. Relax everybody on the inflation front because prices are going to uh, uh, growth in the prices is going to descend to that 2% level. And we're already there. As far as I'm concerned, we're already there. So, but a drop in, de in deflation, that means interest rates should come down and rescue the economy. Is that, is that what I'm well, hearing? Yeah. I mean, the, the, if, if central banks get it right, you know, and it's very difficult to time these things because from the moment an interest rate changes, it takes 12 to 18 months for that to actually flush itself through the economy. And that's because everybody's interest rate contract doesn't get renewed right away. You know, there's a cadence to which mortgage renewals actually happen. You know, you're, the the you know consumer loans that we take out, home equity loans and stuff like that from time to time, those interest rate resets are, are the critical moment. So we're still going to be going through a year this year where those resets are going to be incredibly painful to Canadian consumers. Um, and we could get into the details of that as well. But, you know, essentially we have mortgages uh, that are on anywhere from a two to five year time horizon before uh, a reset actually happens. South of the border, they're, you know, about 70% of the market, I believe, is 30 year mortgages. So they are insulated way more from interest rate increases than we are here in Canada. So it's really going to bite us uh, this year in terms of the effect of prior interest rate increases. Now, by the same token, we can have, and I do believe we're going to have interest rate declines in the second half of this year. But again, it's going to take a while for those to actually have an effect on the economy. So the ability of an interest rate to immediately rescue the economy is limited by the fact that it takes uh, some time for this to actually wash through. And of course, that we're still absorbing uh, the impacts of the higher interest rates that we are seeing. 
I, I know that I'm not sounding incredibly upbeat at the moment, uh, particularly on the Canadian economy. Okay, so embedded prices are going to be with us right now. That's a great, uh, you know, uh, booster for everybody thinking, okay, well, I've got to realign my household budget. Second of all, that household budget is going to get squeezed by higher interest rates continuing into this year. Um, sounds like you're in the gloom and doom camp, Mr. Hall. Well, for the Canadian domestic economy, yes, I'm not upbeat. Um, but I'm talking to the fit audience here, and I'm presuming that even although bad news on the domestic front in Canada isn't great news for all of us here because we live in this domestic economy, we're focused on the external economy here. So give me a little bit of space to uh, be able to unpack that as we continue this interview. Okay. Okay, well, let's uh, let's move into that uh, fit uh, fit group. Let's look at international trade, uh, one of your passions, and of course, the passion of the fit community. And uh, just uh, delve a little bit deeper in the global level. Like, what are the biggest challenges facing international businesses, facing international trade these days? Yeah, there. I mean, there the the worries are manifold, um, and you know, going through the list of them is enough to sort of spook everybody to saying, "Well, maybe I'll just take a year off." Um, but um, I think the bottom line message is we can overcome them. And you know, if there wasn't a positive story to tell on the growth side of things, then I would say, "Yeah, you know, it's time to you know sharpen up the risk management function and just try to react as well as we can." To these bad things uh, that uh, that are actually going on. Well, top of the list is worries about growth and and recession. Uh, there is a real worry that recession is going to be a, a big problem uh, out there. Um, when we get to talking about the U.S. economy, I hope to debunk that myth. And so let's park that for a second. But that's okay. that's one of the key worries uh, at the moment. Uh, the second is this neo protectionism that we're dealing with. Anybody that's in the international trade. Uh, space at the moment is has to be really worried about the fact that you know for a few decades everybody was beating the drum of globalization and you know taking our supply chains and spreading them around the world and seeing the incredible cost advantages gaining economies of scale taking on bigger chunks uh, of the world market and so forth and of course I was speaking very loudly fit was speaking very loudly about the virtues of all of this and now we've got this narrative out there that is anti-globalization that is saying, well, we're not so sure about that model anymore because we have actually invested in nations that have kind of gotten a little bit less friendly with us uh, over time. Well, I think that we were the authors of that fate to some respect because when the global financial crisis happened in 2008, some of the greatest beneficiaries of globalization uh, became its greatest detractors. It became a very me first world. And I think we still have to deal with that because we can't dance in both camps. You know, when, when everything starts to go badly for the world economy, all of a sudden that philosophy that guided us for a few decades can all of a sudden be thrown into the bin. And, and we say, now we got to build walls around our economies and, and make sure that we protect everything. Well, why did everybody flip flop on that? All of a sudden, well, you remember in the wake of the global financial crisis, all of a sudden there were there were truckloads of stimulus being poured out economy by economy. Well, we all said, hey, you know, we want that stimulus to stay within our borders. And um, that's a natural way to feel. But in a globalized world, you realize like there are leakages that are happening, um, but there are leakages out and there are leakages that are coming in as well. And they're supposed to sort of even themselves out. Well, we lost our nerve at that point in time and said, nope, we're going to get protectionist. And everybody's sort of scratching their heads and saying, everybody in the business world is scratching their heads and saying, you politicians, like, how can you flip-flop on us? We've made long-term investments based on what has actually gone on here. Anyway, I could rant on about this for a while, but this, this anti-globalization movement right now, I believe it's transitory. But I don't believe that there are, you know, the states persons out there that are standing in defense of what is still the most efficient way of doing things out there. So we're going to have to, you know, sort of navigate carefully through all of this and all of the institutional fragmentation that's happening at the moment. It's a tough time, but, um, you know, I believe that the voices of reason will actually prevail inside of, uh, of this. Thankfully, there was a pro-globalization discussion at the, the latest big Davos meeting. I'm, I'm heartened by that. Um, there are national security concerns. 
Uh, there's all kinds of nearshoring that's going on. So a rejigging uh, of investment. There's a lot of opportunity inside of that. Um, there's global conflict, which we need to navigate around. Uh, the costs of international trade are being affected by that. That's a key worry. Um, there's sort of this dual orbit world that's happening at the moment. So the BRICS nations are trying to get together and have a reserve currency of their own and, and you know, develop a bit of an ecosystem of their own and so forth, sort of tired of the West uh, foisting its values on them and and so forth. And then there's there's climate uh, uh, and the carbon intensity of trade uh, that uh, will continue to be an issue that we need to work with. So lots of things to worry about out there. Um, but uh, there are lots of antidotes to those worries as well, Caroline. Okay. So there are diamonds in the rough for us upside. Yeah, there are. Yeah. We'll get to them, you know, eventually. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get more specific then. It's it's really good information uh, that we have, uh, particularly for our FIT community. And while we have members um, over the 40 countries around the world, most of our community are Canadian. So I'll get a bit more specific now. Um Mm -hmm. and uh, talk uh, about what you were uh, briefed us on a moment ago, the U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy drives the bulk of our trade here in Canada. So what are your thoughts on U.S. growth and how is that going uh, to go and how is it going to help Canadian exporters? Is there a diamond in the rough for Canadian exporters there? Well, I don't even know if this is a diamond in the rough. I think it's a diamond that's actually sitting out there that people are driving past and not even realizing. Like, I I don't quite understand it because it's shining brilliantly. It's, you know, it's a very clear diamond. It's a very bright diamond. It's a very, you know, uh, E-grade color or whatever. It's a long time since I got engaged. So I, I can't remember the five Cs anymore. But, um, you know, this isn't in the rough. This is already pre-cut. It's there. It's delivered. It's for everybody to look at and take advantage of at the moment. What do I mean by all of that? Well, if you take the U.S. economy where it's at right now and the numbers that we have at the moment, um, given the momentum that we have seen and the latest number that we have is a third quarter of last year, the momentum that's coming off of that guarantees that even if the fourth quarter of last year was zero and each of the quarters of this year are zero, that we get 0.7% growth automatically, just because of the level that GDP is at at the moment. Now we know that the fourth quarter actually grew. And so if you layer on modest growth in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, you get 1% guaranteed. So there's at least a base of 1% growth. Well, at the beginning of the year, the consensus forecast was 1.2, it's barely above the guaranteed level of growth in the US economy right now. So. Uh, folks were decidedly gloomy. More than half of the consensus was actually in the hard landing category. And, you know, I, I look at that and say, wow, you know, this is excessive gloom amongst the foremost experts in forecasting the U.S. economy. This is this is really interesting. I was up at 2%. There was only one other uh, back last November. There's only one other U.S. forecaster that was in the 2% plus category. So we were feeling pretty alone out there and wondering about our own sanity. Um, the funny thing is I did exactly the same thing in 2023 and everybody caught up to that by the end of the year and they're gonna publish like 2.4%. So I was way alone at 2%. There was nobody actually in the consensus in 2023 that was up at the 2% level. I was, I was way out there, outlier forecast, totally alone and they're gonna publish 2.4. So I was actually pessimistic, if you like, at the beginning of 2023. So here I am, you know, sharing this rarefied air with very few other US forecasters and saying, no, we're gonna have another 2% year. Well, I just, did I just get punched drunk on my forecast for last year and so I'm just doing the same thing? No, it's because of this momentum argument. Very slow growth throughout this year, quarter by quarter, which I believe is easily achievable in the United States, would give the United States 1.7% growth. So all the people that were 1.2% and below were sort of really expecting that there was going to be this big recessionary-like correction. Well, they've all got religion now because the numbers are simply not corroborating what is going on. So there was a jump in CPI in January. Well, there's only a jump in CPI if there's strong demand. And it wasn't just one or two categories, it was right across the board. The retail sales numbers are looking very strong for the United States. That covers about 70% of the economy right there. That's a proxy for consumer spending. So as gloomy as Americans are, they're not behaving that way. And so the economy is chugging on. 
investment is doing well because of all of this nearshoring activity plus the regular momentum in the economy and the restoration of supply chains. So layer all of that together. And my 2% forecast, I didn't think was a great stretch. You know, the latest consensus forecast that came out for February, the average forecast is now 2.1. Well, that's a sea change in just two months. So everybody's come to realize that this momentum factor is something that they just can't fight against. And that there is something going on in the US economy right now that they're obviously not understanding. What is that something? That something is that because of a long, low period of growth in the post-global financial crisis years, there is pent-up demand in the United States economy. I'm sort of getting sick of saying that because people are now joking about Peter and his pent-up demand, but that's where we're at with the U.S. economy. And frankly, all of these people that are looking for recessions, even in the wake of these interest rate increases in the United States, are ignoring the fact that there are not pre-recession conditions in the U.S. If there's a bubble of activity that was out there that you could point to, yes, that's pre-recessionary. What we have is an anti-bubble of activity, which indicates that the U.S. economy will grow if it's given the chance to do that. I hope that wasn't too lengthy a response. No. But, that's, you know, well, I, every, I heard, sorry, I heard that it was just great for Canadian exporters, that pent-up demand, the momentum of the numbers, it's great for, and that you are a trailblazer, of course. You know, always sticking, sticking, you're risking it. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, Risky. and I'm not taking I'm not taking crazy risks here, Kelly. No. It was yeah. it was very easy for me to pump out that forecast of 2% when everybody else was saying, well, most of the rest were saying something else and I was just shaking my head saying, like, so you guys were wrong last year, so you're just going to cut and paste your forecast into this year <laughs> and and try it again and say, well, you know, interest rate increases always lead to recessions. It's like, come on, you know, plug yourselves in, understand the fundamentals in the U.S. economy, and it's not an economy that's ready for a recession. You know, there may be a slowing of growth in the middle of the year at some point in time. Yeah, sure. I factored that in. But I still think that overall they can post this kind of growth. Well, that's huge news for the average exporter in Canada, because as you mentioned, 75 percent of what we do is with the United States. And if they're strong, we almost don't need to look at the rest of the world. You know, they're going to pull the rest of the world along, but they're certainly going to pull the Canadian exporting side of the economy along. Well, let's uh, move. When we're talking about the U.S., we can't talk about the U.S. without talking about the U.S. election. Oh, yeah. So what about the U.S. election? What are your thoughts on how this is going to affect, affect Canada one way or the other? Well, Canada has got to pay very close attention to this. One of the top risks, I believe, and I didn't mention it actually when I was talking about uh, the risk list, I wanted to save it. But one of the top risks that we face right now is indeed the next US leader. Because it doesn't matter if there are two candidates there, whichever one of them gets in, they're both protectionist. So you're either going to get somebody who's protectionist or somebody who's an uber protectionist. And the fallout from that, we don't know. Canada has sort of been able to say, hey, you know, we're friends with the U.S. Um, you know, we, we're we always there for the U.S. Um, they're always there for us. We've got a great relationship with them. Uh, their problem is really, you know, if they've got a North American problem, it's really with Mexico. And that has been something that, you know, has, has, uh, prevail, let's say, whenever there have been difficulties in North America. That's an argument that has prevailed in the past. What we need to understand is that whoever gets elected will be the one that oversees the renewal of USMCA in 2026. That is going to happen. And there are some unnerving things that are going on at the moment that might put that at risk. And one of them is all of this nearshoring activity has China very worried that it's going to be shut out of the North American marketplace. You might say, well, China can just sort of go it on its own. It's big enough now. It's got other customers around the world. Does it really need the United States as badly as all that? Well, the truth of the matter is that consumption as a share of GDP in China is way lower than it is in most other places, which means that it's very dependent on international trade still. And if international trade falters, the Chinese economy does not do well. Well, if this nearshoring thing is sort of freezing China out and they're worried about access to the North American market, um, then a clever thing for them to do would be to invest 
in markets that can actually still trade with the United States, can still trade with North America. Well, that's exactly what China's doing. They're investing heavily in places like North Korea. Uh, they're, they're investing in Morocco, uh, of all places, because of the preferential trade agreements that they have with the United States. And they're investing very heavily right now in Mexico. Well, aware of this, um, some of us have been a raise, uh, we've been raising the alarm bell in Washington, D.C. and with Mexican officials, because if the United States all of a sudden wakes up one day and realizes, oh, you know, China's getting in the back door and that gets in the way of, you know, trade in North America, then we got a problem on our hands. That's just one example of things that could uh, could upset the arrangement that we have right now. USMCA is our jewel and we we want to protect that. But thankfully, um, associations in Canada, officials in Canada and officials in the United States are very aware of this right now. And so Janet Yellen herself has been making trips to Mexico City, talking to contemporaries down there. And there is a back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Mexico City um, to try and, uh, and get through all of that. But that's one of the key ways in which the U.S. election could affect Canada. And the watchword is like, however protectionism manifests itself, it's going to be with us for the next four years at least. Okay. Not not a great thought, but something to keep no, eye. It's it's not a great thought, but we've been very successful in the past in dealing mm -hmm. with this, even in the most litigious cases like softwood lumber and the back and forth that we've had in the pork industry and you know, many other things. Um, we can get acrimonious with the United States, but typically we make a good case for ourselves and emphasize as well, you know, this is a friendly relationship. We are very, very joined at the hip. There's a codependence there. All these arguments uh, come out again. And the sentiment that we get right now is that nobody wants to upset the apple cart of this very good relationship. Right. Um, Peter, any quick thoughts on Europe? Uh, anything we should be watching out for? Well, you know, Europe had a rough ride in 2023. And so don't have the momentum that we're talking about for the United States. That's a bit of a worry because, you know, you put the U.S. and Western Europe together. You've got, you know, you're you're moving in on about half of global GDP there uh, by some measures. And, you know, that's a, that's a lot of heft to, to sort of lose when the momentum is low. Um, so you might think, okay, well, um, maybe maybe that really sort of sullies the overall outlook. You know, can America really go it on its own and and what have you? Europe hasn't had a good ride, uh, but not for fundamental reasons. Uh, it's more this war, the Russia-Ukraine war, has really um, uh, exacerbated a situation where food prices were rising high enough already. Um, the uh, difficulties with respect to getting key foodstuffs out of Ukraine and servicing the uh, European market with them, um, certainly not good news uh, for them on the food price front. So they've had specific inflation uh, battles that they've had to deal and then uh, deal with. And then on the energy side of things, of course, a uh, key supplier is Russia. And so with all the, um, uh, I guess, the sanctions that are going on uh, at the moment, uh, security of supply of energy has has really not been uh, good to say the least and has gotten in the way of industrial production in Western Europe. They've had to look at other sources uh, for uh, not only food, but for energy as well. Well, one of those sources was trans-Suez shipments from the Gulf, which are now being compromised by the Middle East war. And so this uh, the whole... Um, uh, Red Sea, Suez, uh, shipping lane has been compromised by terrorism, uh, but also by the risk of, of war that is nearby and how things could be compromised there. And so the costs are rising. Uh, they're having to do sort of trans-cape shipments. That's increasing uh, the costs and so forth. So, you know, these things are inhibiting a Europe that if those things weren't actually in place, uh, would be doing reasonably well because we see the same kind of pent up demand in Western Europe as uh, there is in the United States. So they've had a bit of a rough shake with respect to these price increases. And of course, monetary policy has tightened there as well and uh, and has compromised uh, growth there too. Uh, but the balance of forecasters actually are quite upbeat when 
you look at the forecast, the average forecast for 2024, because of the low momentum that we are actually seeing coming out of um, 2023, to achieve the forecasts that people are calling for requires quite steep uh, quarterly growth. And that paves the path for a much better experience in 2025 in terms of the overall number. The good news is that the quarterly growth is actually at the rates that we are uh, publishing for 2025 as we move through 2024. It's a bit of a technical numbers argument, but what it says is that the growth that is actually expected to occur in Western Europe throughout 2024 is robust compared to what we saw in 2023. Well, that's good news for the world economy, and it's certainly good news for those in the fit community who are trading with Western Europe. Perfect. Great. Um, let's go to emerging markets, because I know you've always been very uh, strong uh, supporter, encourager of diversification and diversification into some of the more challenging markets in the world, which uh, often happen to be some of the fastest growing markets as well. Have your views changed on this, given some of the key developments over the past few years? Well, I think they've had to, uh, Caroline. Um, it, what was really not foreseen was this, the, the extent to which um, Sino-West relations have changed. And uh, this doesn't just concern China-Taiwan. It has to do with China's views on the Russia-Ukraine war and a number of th uh, other uh, issues as well. Those are perhaps the principal ones. And so the difficulties um, are added to by the worries about technical encroachment, political encroachment into other into other economies. And so there's a, there's a great degree of suspicion. This has led to um, you know strategic policies in the United States and elsewhere saying, okay, well, China is not allowed to play in these spaces. We are not going to make investments with their technology companies. We're actually not going to permit investments in technology over there in certain branches and so forth. And this is all something that really wasn't foreseen uh, because it was going swimmingly until the fragmentation started to occur. Okay, so this sort of upsets things because Clearly, um, China, even though it has a one-child policy uh, that has wreaked havoc with population growth, and there's now a soft, they're uh, they're declining from a base population of of 1.4 billion people, and folks are saying, "Ooh, you know, is this China 2.0?" Well, it's not because per capita GDP in China is still very low, and so there's still is. Uh, the uh, a massive amount of opportunity for wealth to increase in inside of China. And even although the population is frozen, the incomes that are growing within that population are enough to drive huge growth in the rest of the world. So China is still a great opportunity, but we have this political issue that's in the way. Well, what's my message then? If I boil it down to the fit audience, you may not be able to deal as easily directly with China. So if you're selling into China, things might be a bit rougher than they were before. Uh, you may not have as easy a ride, but there are other countries through which you can reach the Chinese market. And this, I believe, is one of the key reasons that Canada is investing very heavily in its relationship with the ASEAN nations, and particularly the ASEAN Five. And so this is this is an area where you're sort of looking at the belt uh, or, or the buckle on the belt between uh, trade, uh, between Western nations, let's say, and uh, and the Chinese market itself. There's no question that the Chinese demand is there. That That is a truism that is going to continue. It's accessing that demand that has become much more complicated. And so there are other nations that one can go through. Another frustration is uh, the recent deterioration, I guess, in our relations with India, because India really is the next China, and they don't have the problem of the saw-off in population growth. Demographic growth inside of India is still very strong. And of course, India is really coming into its own at the moment, dealing with some of its political issues, its red tape issues, its infrastructure issues. And the more that those actually get dealt with, and that can be, you know, touted as, as one of the real pluses of Modi being able to, uh, to form majority governments. So you don't have this acrimonious uh, political wrangling that frustrates major 
trans-state initiatives inside of India. Uh, you've got a unit there that has been able to drive things through in a very efficient way. And so uh, the opportunity cost of our current situation with India is very high. Uh, what I believe I've said to uh, the FIT audience before, and I'll reiterate it, is when everybody else is saying, well, you know, things have gone south with India, let's focus on another market or let's just hunker down in the United States. Let's, let's uh, you know, sort of um, firm up everything that we're doing in North America. Well, everybody's thinking that way. It creates an awesome opportunity to forge relations inside of India for that day when I believe inevitably we will patch things up with India and be able to do good business with them. It takes a long time to forge those relationships, a lot of knocking on doors, a lot of trips and so forth. For all of those who have actually made that investment, it's paid off handsomely. There's a long list of Canadian companies that have done very well by that kind of strategy. And while everybody else has turned their eyes away from India, it'd be an awesome opportunity to get in there because there's no question about the fact that India has the strongest growth of any major economy in the world right now. And that's expected to persist for many, many years to come. We have we have good uh, a goodly amount of trade and investment that is happening between India and Canada at the moment. And of course, we have a huge and vastly growing diaspora at the moment, great opportunities to, to be involved in the Indian market. So there it is on emerging markets, you know, my story for China, my story for the ASEAN nations and my story for India. There's lots of other stories I could tell. I wanted to keep it to those three. Okay, great. Well, that's good. We're moving into my next few questions. And with the, that context in mind, uh, let's move into Canada's outlook. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Canadian outlook? Uh, what do we have uh, to look forward to here in Canada this year, 2024? Well, I think the story has already leaked out a little bit uh, mm -hmm. at the moment, but I'm going to sound like a very typical economist. You know, is there growth in Canada uh, in 2024 and 2025? And I'm going to say yes and no. And of course, don't hang up the phone right now. Don't stop watching the video at the moment because yes, I get it. You know, this is the two-handed economist coming out and saying, you know, uh, you're wanting a yes and no answer. And uh, I'm saying maybe. Um, I'll can be more definitive than that. Um, number one, uh, there are two Canadian economies we're talking about right now, and they're very different from each other. The one is the domestic side. We have rising interest rates when we have a heavy amount of indebtedness in Canada, and the rollover of that indebt indebtedness is relatively quick. So let's put that into numbers right now. Back in 2007, uh, we were as indebted as our American cousins. They were getting all the flack for it, and we just sort of hid in the background there. But we both had debt-to-income ratios that were around 150%. And in both cases, that had deteriorated over about a decade's worth of time by about 50 uh, percentage points there. So we were at 100 and we rose to 150. Americans got slammed by that. Their housing bubble broke. All of this profligate lending that they were doing came to a crashing end. And their housing market was devastated by that. And they learned their lesson because what they did was something very un-American at that point in time. If they had just kept their debt to GDP or debt to income ratio rather at 150, that would have been a remarkable achievement. They stopped the growth in their debt to income ratio. If they had just sawed it off, that would have been great. What they actually did was they dropped it again. They got back down over a period of about a decade to 100. So they sawed 50 percentage points off their debt to income ratio. That's a monumental achievement. And nobody would have bet on Americans actually doing that. Well, at the same time, Canada, which was in fundamentally uh, a very different space at that time, a very balanced economy relative to the US economy back in 2007. That's too long a story to tell. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. We were puffed up by the whole experience and we actually increased our debt to income ratio from a very high level, we increased it and it now stands at about 185%. So America's 100%. Well, the consumer is 60% of our economy. And with interest rates rising on a debt load like that, I'm sorry, but we are lucky that we are even 
holding our own at the moment. We are lucky that this economy is not going down. And I would say that one of the things that's sort of rescuing us there is the deluge of immigration that we are, are seeing right now. But anyway, I could go on and on about the consumer. Fundamentally weak. We're not going to get out of this one for a few years. So I could just sort of leave it there. But we also have, um, believe it or not, a housing bubble. With all this immigration coming in, it's creating a frenzy of need for entry-level housing. And so we can't build that stuff fast enough. But the rest of the housing market is in bubble zone and was correcting uh, quite uh, dramatically until this investment came in and sort of uh, sawed off the decline in the numbers. It didn't actually reverse the decline. It sawed it off. And now those prices on average around Canada are declining again. And so that's a sign to me that a very sensitive sector for our economy um, is in trouble. Why I focus on the housing market with a, an international trade audience? Well, it's a leading indicator of all kinds of economic activity. So it's one that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, on the trade side, um, we have our challenges because we don't have great relations with China and India right now. And these are two huge drivers of things. But I flip back over to the U.S. side of things and say, hey, look, you know, with the U.S. economy that is going well, we've got lots of money to make on the international trade side of things. And if you think about it this way as well, um, America has a very low unemployment rate right now, and they're struggling to find industrial capacity. And this is sort of a throwback to the disruption of supply chains and so on and so forth. There's lots of things, lots of reasons why the industrial capacity just isn't there. Well, with our domestic economy softening, if we can use some of the capacity that gets freed up for international trade and to give that capacity or to lend that capacity to Americans, I think we've got a lot of work to do there that will be very lucrative for us. So that's the sense in which there are two different things that, that are going on here. The U.S. economy is strong, nearshore invest, investing and uh, trade flows uh, are creating opportunities uh, on the employment front. Uh, we're going forward with trade promotion, so it's not just a U.S. thing. Uh, we're venturing into a very potentially fast growing area in ASEAN. And of course, Canada has got a long lineup of products that the rest of the world actually wants. So we got a lot going for us on the international trade side of things. And I want to leave our fit audience with a very upbeat message about um, the fact that that potential is there. And this is a moment where we really need to be up periscope on what those uh, opportunities are and to be ready to cash in on them to cut through the gloom and doom and to realize that uh, fundamental growth is actually there to pursue that growth as hotly as we possibly can. Well, let's do that then. I think we can sum it up in a moment here. So from what I'm hearing, there's weakness inside Canada, but there's so much opportunity uh, in the international trade sphere. And this tends to be the norm every year, uh, all the time. It's just the environment is constantly changing and the opportunities are changing as well as the weaknesses. But for today and going forward, could you sum it all up uh, and give us some final strategic tips or your words of wisdom for uh, our audience today, Peter? Thanks, Caroline. Absolutely. This is probably the most important uh, point in the presentation. You know, we sort of boil it down to big messages. So number one, I'd say first and foremost is the point that I just left uh, uh, with us. The U.S. will continue to grow. And now those gloomy forecasters have turned the page. They're actually not gloomy anymore. And most of them are saying, hey, we're not going to have a recession this year. So it's not just Peter Hall out there, lonesome voice. Uh, in two months, there's been a flip-flop down there. And that's a flip-flop that I believe that you can bet on. Uh, that economy is still the same point, has capacity limitations. So look for opportunities there. They're looking for folks like you to come to them with a capacity solution for them. And so if you can provide that solution, they're going to love you. Uh, number two, nearshoring is reallocating production closer to home. So I would strongly encourage the fit audience to follow these movements, uh, to shore up as the existing supply arrangements, but to look for opportunities to be a nearshoring solution for these new investments, to actually get involved in the investments themselves, whether these investments are in Canada, in the United States, or in Mexico. This is a huge but temporary trend, I believe, and one to take great advantage of. So number one, growth in the U.S. Number two, nearshoring is opportunity. Number three, I'm never going to let go of this. 
Uh, diversification of trade is alive and well. It's the real solution to longer term growth and international competitiveness. So I can't emphasize enough that in spite of the difficulties that are going on right now, this is where the growth is. Find a way to mitigate those risks. There are lots of people that are doing it. You won't be the only ones. I will tell you that this is your ticket to future prosperity, to gaining the economies, the global economies of scale that will put you ahead of the competition. And I would like nothing better than to see Canada going head to head with the rest of the world and developing global champions. We're not going to do it if we ignore the fact that the hot growth zones are really the ones that are going to help us to actually get to that point. Um, don't forget Mexico, by the way. You know, it's an emerging market where per capita incomes are rising hugely, and it's almost on our doorstep right now. So uh, that should be a part of anybody's strategy, selling into that marketplace. The Chinese are actually beating us to the game uh, in that marketplace. They're seeing those per capita income gains that are happening in Mexico, and uh, they're actually being very creative about selling into the market itself. Number four, risks. Are manifold as i said before don't let them shut down your trade initiatives before taking a look at serious options to managing those risks my final point that i'll say to you is the rising complexities of trade mean that fitz education program has probably never been more needed never more important and never more valuable so that means that those with the fit training already have a leg up and uh, will be a more important asset, I believe, to their companies, to your companies, uh, as you go forward. And so, you know, I wasn't paid to, to say that. That's just a truism that comes out of all of this, because those who are able to deftly navigate the intricacies of international trade inside of their companies, uh, I believe, if they're not already very important inside of their companies, if you are not already a key person inside there, the circumstances that we are facing globally right now, and the fact that this Canadian economy is going to need international trade to bail it out, is going to make you very critical to the processes that you are in charge of at the moment, and I believe will expand your empire. So Caroline, for you and your group, uh, continue to pull out all the stops and what it is that you're doing. You're doing great work. And for those who are the recipients or are midstream and CITP or are actually thinking about it, it's a designation that uh, itself uh, is no diamond in the rough. It's a, it's a true diamond and uh, it's, uh, its brilliance is, uh, is beginning to show. So thank you so much for having me here today uh, to be able to make uh, these points. And I certainly uh, open myself up to ongoing dialogue with uh, those in the FIT community. Uh, please don't be a stranger. Always happy to talk with you about what's going on in the world. Okay, well, listen, Thank you so much, Peter. It's just, I always enjoy speaking to you because you're you're so realistic. Uh, you don't hide the truth, but you're always able to find uh, the diamond in the rough or you're always able to point out the diamond that I, you know somebody's walking by. Um, and uh, so I really, really appreciate that. Thank you uh, to all of those who stayed with us for this interview. As international trade professionals, our learning never, never stops. And Peter, I thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Mm -hmm.